Today down in the comments, I want to hear what your favorite Mexican horror film is. Bonus points if it's currently in print on Blu-ray, DVD, or available on streaming, uh, because as we're going to kind of talk about, many of the best ones aren't. Hello, I'm Adam Caesar. I am the author of a bunch of different books that you can go uh, read and order and listen to the audiobooks right now. Uh, and the upcoming Clown in the Cornfield from Harper Teen. Before we start, real quick, don't usually do the sales pitch up front, uh, but a lot of people have reached out either through DMs or through email or through my website uh, and have asked what is the best way uh, for them to pre-order Clown in the Cornfield. Uh, they, they mean like, oh, uh, what's the way that I get the most money or that helps me the most? Um, and that's really, really nice. That's really sweet. And I, I, I appreciate every single one of those messages that I've gotten. Uh, like that, so thank you. But the answer is, the true answer is, it, it, it doesn't matter where you get the book. Uh, it doesn't, like, some marginally help me more than others, um, but it doesn't, it really doesn't matter. As long as you get a copy of the book, uh, it, it helps me out. Even if you get it, if you get it from your local library, that's great. If you choose to buy the hardcover, that's great. If you choose to get the audiobook, that's great. If you choose to get the ebook, that's great. Uh, wherever you get either any of those things, whatever vendor you feel most comfortable with, that's great. And I have links for all those vendors and places you can get it down in the description of this video. And uh, the thing that really does help out the most, more than where you get the book, uh, is, is that you talk about the book, is that you tell your friends about the book, and that you leave a quick review either on Goodreads or on Amazon. And since those are kind of the biggest platforms and they help the most, uh, and if you cross post your reviews, if you just copy paste them, that's great too, it really helps out. So that's, that's kind of the, the way you can help me in the book out beyond just buying it wherever you wanna buy it. Uh, yeah, there's gonna be a beautiful hardcover, I don't have them yet, but we're, we're one month away, guys, so it's, it's getting real at this point, I'm excited. I feel like this is a very special episode because I feel like we haven't had uh, a, a movie or movies that connect to the book and a book that connects to the movies uh, as well as we've had this episode. So if you usually um, either just skip to the book recommendation or close the video before the book recommendation happens, I, this is, the, this is the, the video where I would say, don't do that because I kind of talk about both the book and the movies back and forth a little bit. Today we are talking about two films, two new Blu-rays, uh, semi-new Blu-rays uh, that are from the same line, from the same kind of imprint. They are both Mexican uh, horror films. Uh, quasi horror gothic films, The Skeleton of Mrs. Morales uh, from 1960, and Even the Wind is Afraid from 1968. Uh, we'll talk about both these movies, uh, what I liked about them, uh, what I liked about how they're presented, what I didn't like about how they're presented, and uh, then we will talk about our book recommendation, which connects directly to these. First film we're going to talk about is, uh, not to spoil it, but the one that I liked uh, more. This is The Skeleton of Mrs. Morales. It's directed by uh, Rogiello A. Gonzalez, a uh, very prolific uh, Mexican director, made over uh, 70 films uh, in his career. This was a somewhat early one, um, but it is one of his most notable ones. And from what little I could find about the film, is generally considered one of the like kind of exemplars of of of, of uh, Mexican cinema, uh, not just genre cinema, but all of Mexican cinema. And this is a movie. Uh, that just like from the opening moments of it as I'm watching it kind of like like wow Why have I never heard of this movie before? Um, why why haven't I seen this movie before and I think a lot of it has to do with we don't Get these movies. This is not like kind of like a criterion uh, edition uh, Presentation of this film and a lot of these films and a lot of uh, Mexican cinema and, 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 and Mexican commercial cinema we don't have an outlet for nice, uh, cleaned up, restored editions, representations, reappraisals of these films. Um, and that's something that VCI seems to be changing a little bit with this. It's, both of these movies have this banner on them. Classicals del Cine Mexican. Uh, I took six years of high school Spanish and uh, I took it on Long Island, New York, so my pronunciation is just so terrible, so bad. Um, but uh, this is a new label. They've released like Four or five movies so far, I think they kind of batched them, uh, did them a little bit all at once, and maybe they're going to do more. 
I chose the movies that looked most genre. Some of them are just uh, are, are dramas, um, or, or uh, I think there might be one Western one. They aren't um, they aren't restricted. These aren't classics de cinema de terra uh, de Mexico. Uh, these are not. Um, it's not a explicitly a horror or a genre cinema line, but VCI has done a lot of uh, horror movies. Their, their edition of City of the Dead is really, really good. Kiss of the Tarantula, uh, you know, the, the wonderful Graydon Clark, Satan's Cheerleaders. These movies all kind of got nicer editions with special features and, and, and context and all that than these, um, these recent uh, Mexican cinema classic uh, line seems to be being treated to. Now, I'm sure part of that is because they're slightly older films. Um, part of them is because I'm sure um, more explicitly horror films have more of a um, of a genre fan pull, but also just because these aren't as well known here in the States. So there's probably not that much reason for VCI, which is a, a good label that I like a lot of the uh, products they put out. I'm rambling a bit, but when this movie first started, you're treated to a uh, title card and so based on a, an Arthur Machen story and, and us horror fans and, and uh, we, the great God Pan and all these, these kind of people who like um, early uh, 1900s uh, horror fiction like Arthur Machen and there's a real kind of Hitchcock meets EC Comics meets uh, you know kind of Tales from the Crypt kind of uh, a black comedy uh, feeling to this movie and it really did take me by surprise because it plays with genre and it plays with your expectations and it plays with the audience in a, in a very sly way, a very, um, a way that, that feels more nuanced than when you kind of, when you have these kind of late 50s, early 60s um, costume melodramas. There was something there that, that felt a little bit more playful, that felt maybe like a, a William Castle versus a, um, versus a Hitchcock, but also just like generally more sumptuous and better put together film than, than maybe most William Castle movies, even though I love William Castle. Uh, I really, really liked this movie. Uh, the plot, very briefly, Dr. Morales and his wife, Mrs. Morales, and they are in this, uh, I don't want to say completely loveless because there's clearly was love there at some point. They're in this kind of loveless uh, uh, relationship where uh, Mrs. Morales has become very religious and has all these different neur neuroses and, and quirks and um, problems with her health, she has a bad leg, um, and she is, she is, when we first meet them, she's kind of slowly begun to turn the town and the people in her church group kind of against her husband. She's like poisoning the well against her husband, where we're not quite sure if what she's saying is true, but some of this stuff seems a little outlandish, and some of it doesn't match up with what we're seeing of this guy. And Dr. Morales is a taxidermist, so there's this really cool, really foreboding, set that we're on where the you know above his workshop is there is where they live and then below the workshop is all this cool animal bones and all the different tools of taxidermy that look very sinister and we know are going to kind of come into play in the third act and she's she's kind of pushing him and pushing him and pushing him and we get to a point in the movie where a murder may or may not take place and the rest of the movie is trying to figure out just actually if there was a crime and what the crime was and who did it and why, and if they're going to get away with it. Um, a pretty simple story, 90 minute movie, really moves fast. Uh, a pretty simple story, but all it's all just in that execution, all just in how beautiful this black and white photography is, um, and how um, funny and, and enjoyable the performers are. Uh, it is, I really, really, really can't overstate how much I like this movie. If you're gonna pick up one of these two Blu-rays, if you like, films of this era, if you can, uh, if you don't want something that's necessarily all out blood and guts, I really, really, really recommend uh, The Skeleton of Mrs. Morales. It's really funny and uh, for a movie where you think you know where it's going a lot of the time, it has some interesting wrinkles and twists and turns and just general gallows humor. Um, they put right on, again, the like the design here and stuff on, on like the VCI stuff is not, again, not on that arrow level of like look at here this fine boutique product you're getting they put a lot of words on here but one of the words that's kind of been photoshopped on here is a major 4k restoration and that part is true the movie looks unbelievably good it looks really really good um that black and white photography really really pops looks great which brings us to our second film which 
honestly does not look nearly as good even though it is a color film even though it was made nearly 10 years later you'd think oh this is the movie that'll look better because it's more recent not 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 really true this is even the wind is afraid uh, this is directed by carlos enrique taboada uh now uh remember that last name remember the name taboada when we start talking about this week's book recommendation um but this is um another director who was incredibly prolific but unlike gonzalez almost all of taboada's like kind of major films are horror films or supernatural films or gothic films um, and this one was was popular enough. They remade it. I haven't seen the remake. I've just 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 seen this one. This is more genre than the skeleton of Mrs. Morales because it is a ghost story. It is a it is a ghost story um, in the gothic tradition at a uh, boarding school uh, for young women uh, where we have there's this tower in the boarding square where, where a student um, before the story even starts, has, has committed suicide, and the, the tower is allegedly haunted by that ghost. And we have the kind of plucky uh, group of students, of classmates, that are trying to unravel this mystery. And at the same time, we have the kind of domineering headmistress, uh, the likable um, and kind of uh, kind of sister surrogate for these classmates, the teacher. And then we have like the the like the shady groundskeeper who knows the the, the school's dark secrets. So it's filled with the kind of a lot of these these earmarks of kind of gothic tropes and almost kind of uh, Nancy Drew, Scooby-Doo um, kind of uh, signifiers. So much so that that for a good 80% of the movie, I was kind of having this eternal deba internal debate, especially after watching a, a movie where it's, things are not supernatural, uh, watching this movie being like, is this even a ghost? I know we're presenting this like it's a ghost story, but is this even a ghost story? Is the twist going to end up being uh, terrestrial or not supernatural? Uh, and I'm not going to say which it ends up being, but the the movie kind of does play with that and does have a back and forth with that and, and tries to subvert your expectations in, super, in, in different ways. Um, where uh, the skeleton of uh, Mrs. Morales uh, completely engaged me, kind of had me locked in from, from, from day one, uh, even the wind is afraid starts out with like such promise where it seems like it, it, it might be like a almost like a 10 little Indian setup where we have a sprawling cast of, of, of classmates that you know might get whittled down or something like it was is unclear what this was but it does have just a general hangout movie vibe to it uh, for the first hour of the film and I, I you do really like the the kids the girls they're kind of charming and they, the the best scenes in the movie really are just little slice of life scenes that, that are that just feel very um 60s uh kitsch enjoyable characters enjoyable uh actors with like their hair all all done up and and being uh kind of mean to each other but kind of nice to each other uh so that that portion of the film is enjoyable but it does start to kind of you're looking at your watch a little bit being like all right is there gonna be genre stuff in this movie and eventually there is and eventually there is an introduction of a plot element that i really didn't see coming that i really really enjoy um that that you almost or at least i did wish was in more of the film i wish more of the film had been spent in that last kind of 25 minutes where there are clearly there's clearly something very um horror going on uh clearly um a direct mystery to be solved, a direct threat, a direct peril to these characters. Uh, but for so much of the movie, you don't have that. Not that not that movies need like the highest stakes or need to be the bloodiest, craziest things. But there is a certain uh, like sunniness to this movie that just it's just that way the whole time. There's like a couple scenes in the the clock tower that are that are that are creepy, but it's not trying. To, it's not trying to you know scare your pants off. This movie. It's just kind of almost a pleasant diversion uh which there's nothing wrong with that so i liked the both of these very much i would uh definitely give a more rousing endorsement to to the skeleton of mrs morales uh i really hope this line continues and i really hope that they put more horror movies in this line and the reason i'm saying that is because back like you know maybe t it's probably 10 years ago now maybe even 15 years ago now uh when dvd was kind of all the rage and you had all these different um dvd labels consistently putting stuff out and you had stores actually stocking this stuff so you had best buy best buy would would have anchor bay and, and shout factory and 
Mondo Macabro discs, they would sell at Best Buy and stuff like that. So back then you had movies like A La Carta coming out and Satanical Panamodium. And uh, you had, there was this great label called Casa Negra, which put out The Black Pit of Dr. M, uh, which is a great Mexican horror film. Uh, Brainiac, which uh, is a monster movie, but I, I'm, I'm a simple man. I have simple tastes. I love brain-sucking monsters. Several different vampire films. Um, I just wish there was a label like that now. Um, and Vinegar Syndrome and, and all these other companies are kind of picking up the slack a little bit, but it really does still seem like a lot of those movies are not available anymore. Um, and they were on DVD at one point, and you kind of, the way the cycle goes of like, oh, well, now, uh, you know, a different label has that, and, you know, actually, like, Code Red's putting that out. You'd, you'd think that they would kind of get shuffled back into the, the cycle, but because there is, uh, I guess, slightly less of a demand for foreign language films, and then among foreign language films, it's like Italy and Spain and France kind of get the, the bigger uh, ticket uh, releases with, like, Redemption and them. Uh, it just doesn't seem to be a place that's consistently doing Mexican horror films, and there seems to be a lot of them. Uh, Tabuado has a bunch of movies listed on IMDb and, and Wikipedia that seem very interesting and seem really cool just from the titles and from the posters, um, but you can't find them anywhere. Uh, so I'm hoping that VCI uh, continues this line and keeps putting these movies out. That said, there's absolutely zero special features on these discs. There's just the back of the box. There's no liner notes, there's no anything. Like, so I would really like some more context for these movies, especially this one, which seems pretty important. Um, there was just, I had to look online and you can really not find anything. It's just like different people's blog posts and stuff like that. Toss a, toss a couple bucks to special features and at least do a comment, some, have someone do a commentary on these to, to explain what the heck I'm seeing. Uh, Cause I like that context and I, I enjoy the, the culture of, of movies and I enjoy the, the history of movies. So I'd like to know more about how these were made. Uh, so yeah, that's my plea to VCI. Put more of these movies out and please just spend a couple bucks on uh, liner notes or a commentary or some kind of context to uh, what these films are and why they're important. And why they are classics del cine Mexico. Like, I wanna know. Uh, all of that is to lead us to our um, very connected, uh, very special uh, book recommendation. If you watch BookTube, uh, if you follow uh, you know, the New York Times bestseller list and stuff like that, you've probably heard of Mexican Gothic by Silvio Morena Garcia. Now, uh, if that name sounds familiar to you and you've been watching the channel for years and years, uh, a few years ago, 2017 now, I cannot believe I've been talking at my phone this long, uh, I had uh, done a, a kind of quick listicle of the best vampire books you haven't read, and I included Silvia Morena Garcia's uh, Certain Dark Things, which I thought was one of the best vampire books I'd ever read. One of the kind of the, it had this, uh, this great kind of blade like vampire underworld of vampires that were also shapeshifters, so it felt very um, unique and was very cool and very dark. Um, but that book's out of print now. There's, I, I don't really know why, since it was a somewhat recent book, uh, but it's allowed to, be, to lapse out of print, so you can't get that book right now, Certain Dark Things, which I loved. You can watch that video and, and hear me talk about it. Um, but uh, the good news about uh, Mexican Gothic coming out and being a hit and everyone liking it is that uh, that uh, Certain Dark Things is coming back into print and Tor is doing that through their new horror line. So there you go. Everything has a happy ending. Uh, Mexican Gothic is, uh, uh, it is what, what it says on the tin. It is a, a Mexican Gothic uh, story, a Mexican Gothic horror, a Mexican Gothic romance, whatever you want to call that specific subgenre of books with heroines and petticoats either walking away from or walking towards uh, dark and foreboding castles. It is that kind of book. And I initially was a little scared off by that title and that idea, but I, I love this author's uh, work and I, I, I was very excited to read it anyway. And it was like very much not gonna be like the kind of thing of like, oh, theme is gonna keep me away from uh, a book. And I'm very, very glad it didn't because this is a very full-blooded horror novel. Um, it is, it does engage with those Gothic archetypes and those Gothic tropes but it does so in uh, what I would call, um, even though the book's set in the 50s, um, it does engage with those 
those tropes and those archetypes in a very modern way, it feels like. And it, 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 in, in both the pacing and the thematics feel very now and very modern. Um, I really, really love this book. It is about a, uh, a young woman named Noemi, wait for it, Tabuato, and she is kind of charged by her father to, um, to go investigate this weird letter uh, that, he, that he has received uh, from her cousin. Her cousin uh, married this guy that they don't know a lot about, uh, lives, they live in Mexico City, lives kind of in the boonies in this, um, this English style estate uh, that, that has servants and it has a whole family living there. Um, and she's, she's, she's personally invested in it because she wants to kind of, she is this, this, this socialite rich girl who kind of wants to, who wants to continue her studies, wants to continue college. Um, and the dad basically says, we'll figure this, let's figure out this family business and then, you know, you can, you can continue on. So she's invested in this in that way, uh, but also she loves her cousin and she misses her cousin. And when she arrives at this, um, you know, initially very spooky uh, and only gets spookier uh, house full with these, full of these, um, these, this family that the, the cousin's married into that's very strange. They're these, this kind of imperialist family that owns a silver mine. And there's all this kind of, there's the, the brother that she, that the cousin's married. There's the other brother who's like uh, a nicer but uh, more tragic version of, 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 the, of the bolder brother. Um, there's the patriarch who's this like rotting husk of a, of a man who's always sick, um, who's, who has like a fleet of servants taking care of him. There's the mother that's just super mean uh, and trying to clearly contain family secrets and contain uh, what Noemi sees and does and uh, when she can go to the village and when she can do all this different stuff. Um, and then there's Noemi who just wants to kind of get her cousin back to health. The cousin sent this kind of a little bit cryptic, crazy letter. Maybe there's something wrong with her mentally. Uh, they're saying there's something wrong with her physically. Uh, they're saying she has that, that she's ill and she just needs rest. And there's this doctor that's, that, that seems like a quack and he seems like he's totally uh, kind of under the thumb of the family. There are... Um, weird discussions about eugenics and uh, Darwinian theory and then uh, weird discussions about psychology and Jung and, and, uh, and Freud uh, and then there then start these dream sequences and usually if you if you if you read enough horror fiction or if you listen to enough horror criticism um, you'll find you'll inevitably find the, the person that, that vehemently argues against dream sequences like oh you know if they don't add anything to the story or they're just like there to to be you know cheap scares or whatever when the art when the author couldn't think of anything else like the, like the, you'll hear that argument pop up again and again and uh mexican gothic is kind of the perfect example of uh no you can do whatever you want in a book uh, as long as you do it well because there are these there's these dream sequences where where Naomi starts to, to even ha uh, sleepwalk and stuff like that. And as the dream sequences get more and more surreal, more and more weird, and more and more really kind of like, um, they take it out of the gothic a little bit. They, t they put it more in like even body horror and uh, like you put in the mind of like a, a Frank Henelotter movie in a, or, a, um, or a Stuart Gordon movie, um, which Stuart Gordon did dabble in the gothic. But you like as these dream sequences kind of intensify and as they get more explicitly linked to as she's learning about the history of this family that she's living with and investigating um you see the why you you want these dream sequences in there um and and how they directly relate to what happens later in the novel when things kind of things get really things get physicalized like around like the 60 percent mark of the book um and it really does, kind of doesn't stop from there. So it's, it, it has the, all the hallmarks of a, of a gothic um, tale, but it never feels like it has the kind of, you know, at least personally, the things I don't 100% respond to about that genre of just, of just feeling like things are a, a little bit lower stakes, feeling like things are like too much, like, like why do we have like six love triangles in this thing? Like it, it doesn't really have the stuff that that I think many modern readers would consider either like the boring stuff or the or the or the antiquated stuff it just has the good stuff it just has that kind of the feeling of like they, they, there's so many little threads that are thrown in early and even either through these dream sequences or through um or through just general 
foreboding or things that might be, you know, might come up. Like there's this fungus, there are these, uh, the snake imagery and kind of general religious imagery that's all around the house. Um, uh, talk about bloodlines and family roots and stuff like that. And it all kind of adds up to this great feeling of, uh, of dread. And then you get payoff, 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 payoff. It's really, really uh, kind of immaculately constructed. Really a great book. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's wonderful. Um, I may even like it better than Certain Dark Things, uh, even though I love that book a lot, uh, too. Like we said, uh, Taboada, I, that is not a mistake. The, the, she definitely named these characters after this, um, kind of famous, famous Mexican Gothic director. Um, and if there were, if I needed any more proof than that, I, I, I typed up the author's name, I typed up Taboado, and there was, I found a, I'll put it down in the link down in the description for the Idsmouth Free Press. Uh, she had written a, um, a kind of appreciation of the director and how he influenced Guillermo del Toro and stuff like that. So I did not plan to, uh, I did not, it was just a happy accident there are, that there are these, this kind of many touchstones between these two films and Mexican Gothic. I, I mean, I knew I was going to read the book and I knew I was going to uh, watch and review these movies, uh, but boy, this, this video came together in a real peanut butter and jelly style. I recommend everything I talked about here. Um, some more than others, and I think you could figure out that ranking. Uh, definitely read the book. Um, if you're into movies, uh, definitely check out The Skeleton of Mrs. Morales. And if you want to like have the book kind of enhanced by something like visual, definitely check out uh, Even the Wind is Afraid. Even though I think Mexican Gothic is is a is a better Gothic uh, tale than the than the film ends up being, but I still enjoyed it. I still liked uh, learning something new. That's it. This was a long one. I didn't plan to talk this much about these things, but, you know, sometimes I just get excited. Uh, I'm Adam Caesar. Uh, I'll put all my links down in the description, Twitter, Instagram, books, where you can get the books. Please, please, please consider uh, a pre-order, or if you're watching this in a month, just plain ordering uh, Clown in the Cornfield. Uh, it's a slasher, uh, and I'm really, really, really happy with it. So Clive Barker called me an author who knows how to make us afraid. See if that's true. See if see if Mr. Barker's right. Check it out. All right. Like, subscribe, all that stuff. I'll see you next time, guys. <laughs>